because he reminds us, or God chooses to remind us that what we think of as maybe not so important, he treats as just as important in a microcosmic way as we like to think of God in a macrocosmic way. Huh? You know, when you don't feel good, sometimes it really gets confusing. Of course, whenever people are talking to me, sometimes they say, I can get confusing. <laughs> because I can get into the logic of it, much less the science of it, and also the dissertation within the realm of theological premises and ideas that most people come up with that they try to argue and debate and discuss and come up to realities that they think that they understand which they don't extend it all the way outward in order to have a complete comprehension of the entire picture with which they make and present their own debate and discussion of what they think that they understand that they know that they present to and offer as argumentation in reality offering up the suppositions that they think that they are in written in stone so that they have not run into anybody that would actually Discuss with them premise by premise, line by line, precept upon precept, every single detail with which they seek to line out the reality of God. But, most Jews, hey, you know, you could kind of figure it out pretty quick, you know, like, you go from one to one to one to one, you know, and if somewhere along the way that one, 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 let's put it this way. The best way to understand when someone is off in their logic it's very simple. It's a long line of ones. One, 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 one. As soon as you find a zero, it's off. That's all. It's just code. It's just, to me, simple. Most people will say, and this is what Proverbs teaches you if you decide to, you know, really believe the Bible for what it says. Proverbs says that the words of a man's mouth will be literally his own condemnation. Out of his own mouth, the things that he will say will contradict himself unless, now there is one exception to that, unless he has arranged his conversation, in other words, he has chosen to examine the words with which he's speaking so that they don't contradict themselves, much less the point that he's making when he is offering up his conversation and word by word dissertation of what he is presenting in information to a person who's trying to listen. Because that is where you find the sin lies at the doorstep that Proverbs talks about. That's where most articulate type of people were very aware of the choice and selection of the words that were used in Middle Eastern custom in order to present yourself. Because that would be a way and a means with which to understand whether truth was being spoken or lies. And so... A lot of times people tell me all kinds of things, you know, that they start off by saying, you know, this is this. And then they go out and they contradict themselves by partway through their statement changing whatever it was that they said. And then I'll mention it to them, look, I know you said this is this, but now you say this is this. And that contradicts what you just said about this is this. And usually with most no offense to anyone, but most Gentile people or Western culture people that I've met, they can do it within, oh, I don't know, 10 sentences, sometimes less. And I don't understand why, you know, and my wife likes to say that it's the gift of discernment, you know, and word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and I try to tell her, well, no, it's just kind of Programmers and people that use code when they're building computers, they understand how things flow. And a person that does mathematical equations, they understand how the equations have to balance and work out. That's why they keep working on these long, you know, can post up all these equations on walls, you know, and try to balance them out and make them work. You know, and then when they come up with the conclusion, then it's solved. The mind of God that he created us with is a small minutiae of the greater mind that he has that he has put everything in order. 
So he cares about the smallest of things that they are true, as well as the biggest of things that they are true. Because there's a consistency to God from alpha to omega, from beginning to end, through all, and as you extend it outward, we would say, to the infinite to the infinite, or ages to ages, that God does not contradict himself ever in any way, shape, or form. The perspective of the person may be contradicted or contraindicated, but God is never a, contract, a contradiction. The contraction of our intelligence is the problem, and so our dissertation has to incorporate the reality of who God is, what he is, and what he wants for us. So he cares about the smallest of things as well as the biggest. Like today, he cared about me so much that he provided for me nausea medication that I could take for nausea because I've been feeling really pretty out of it today. And he's provided just a kind of quiet time where I didn't have to feel so pressured to do things. He's also provided some chastisement to say, you know, now this is some of the things you haven't been doing now that I got your attention. Pay attention. And I'm thankful that my God is so intimately involved in my life that he cares about all the little things that well, one of the things that he brought up was, you know, I kind of need to clean house. <laughs> it's kind of messy, you know, and it's like when you put your house in order, you put your life in order. Now, I don't know if you understand that, but here's a gentleman that, you know, kind of drives me crazy. You know, he's he's one of the few pastors that, you know, I uh, had the blessed opportunity to watch grow from no ministry to big ministry to little ministry to big ministry to little ministry and multiple ministries and, you know, go through his gyrations as a man of God and a type for me to watch and to see how men of God, ministers and pastors and elders and deacons and people, would sometimes go through these <laughs> I don't want to say conf conflagrations, com com I have a word that begins with C-O-M, but I can't think of it. But the blessing that he was on the things that he blessed me with was one of them was that he used to teach. Now, you know, he probably got it from somewhere else, as most pastors that I know do, that you could tell a man's life by how he kept his house. Now, I know he didn't say it that way, but that's where I later learned it from some other source that was Christian, you know, oriented back in... Christian history. But basically he said, you know, if your house is messy, your life is messy. Well, you know, later when you saw his house, you know, you kind of realize, well, that kind of fits, you know. <laughs> He's always working on his house, so that was kind of fit too, you know. Well, praise the Lord, God brought me to the mindset that even though I don't feel good, you know, and I'll, I'm probably going to take a nap and sleep a lot again, that my house is messy and I need to work on it. You know, I've been working on my plants, I've been working on my stuff, but I need to work on some of the other things, too. Not just laundry and vacuuming and stuff, but other things that, you know, maybe putting it in order for these latter days and latter times so that it would be more cohesive and work better for me, including moving. But enough about me. And when I don't feel good, sometimes I, I may wander. But then my mind seems to always go back to where it belongs, which is in Christ, in the mind of Christ, and in those things that Jesus leads us to, which would be in my utmost, shallow and profound. Wherefore, whether, therefore, you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31. You know, I want to say something about that. Of course I want to say something about that. God doesn't care about... <laughs> if you celebrate Thanksgiving or if you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah you know or whatever you know my gosh or go out on Halloween and collect some candy and eat it speaking of which that sounds good if I had some candy corn I think I'd go eat it I probably will but God isn't interested in that which is going into your body because your body was designed in order to expiate it. You know, you're going to get rid of it, believe me. You know, you have a constitutional that you do in the morning, which doesn't mean that you can constitute something, but you get rid of the waste, if you know what I mean. And God designed the body to do that. But being that 
whatever you do or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. If you bring God in it, and God allows you to bring Him in it, then it can't be wrong. As long as you don't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit or your conscience telling you it's wrong, and you know you have God in you, then don't worry about what other people say. Because there are Puritans out there that would put a stake in the ground and burn you as a witch if they could see the liberty with which you operate within grace. Because a lot of times people don't seem to understand that God doesn't care so much about what you're doing per se as long as what you're doing with him is what you're accomplishing. Because if God is in it, then he will let you know. And if you have a relationship with God, he will tell you what to do. You don't have to be worried about holidays or holy days or any days or the Sabbath days or the Sundays or the Mondays or the whatever days, you know, that people make up in order to try to make some day worse or better or up or down or the sick days or the healthy days. All of those days are what days you were supposed to be involved with God in and bring him in so that you would have a personal relationship intercommunicative with him in dealing with the day. For this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. So don't let anyone steal your joy. Never over any day, or circumstance really, but any day. Beware of allowing yourself to think that the shallow concerns of life are not ordained of God. They are as much of God as the profound days. It is not your devotion to God that makes you refuse to be shallow, but your wish to impress other people with the fact that you are a spiritual prig. Prig, whenever the ancient word, Old English, is being used, simply meant a jerk. Let's be real. A spiritual prig is just a jerk. And being a jerk is one of the byproducts of being a man. <laughs> As every woman can testify. Amen, brother. I used to say, you know, in Bible studies that, you know, whenever I led a Bible, I used to lead this one Bible study that was called, uh, I think it was called the Last Chance Bible, no, it might have been called the Last Chance Bible Study, but anyways, I led a Bible study that had just a few women in it, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I think it was just women, just a few women in it, and one thing I'd always start off with whenever I got into some discussion about something about some point in scripture, I'd say, well, all men are jerks, you know. And then the grace of God has come upon us so that we become, you know, babes in Christ and grow up to be, you know, children of God, and later to become men of God. And we walk, you know, in the light as he is in the light. And we have fellowship with the light and Jesus becomes alive in us so that it's no longer we that liveth, but Christ that liveth in us. So we're no longer jerks, but we're actually sons and daughters of God or sons of God. So men become, and that's what their goal is, to attain to becoming a son of God. Not in and of themselves, but that Jesus is alive in them, so it's obvious that they appear to be sons of God. So what you fall in love with isn't necessarily the man, but the person inside the man. And they thought of it, because the only thing they remembered was, all men are jerks. And to this day, I know that they don't remember all the other scriptural parts that was there, but they remember all men are jerks. So, what is being said here about a spiritual prig is the fact that a lot of us try to impress each other with our jargon, our words. You know, we try to, we put on a suit and tie to impress. We learn the latest anthropomorphism. We learn the latest drash. We try to go Hebraic on it or Armenian. Armenian our, we, people try to go Hebraic on you and then they try to go Aramaic on you and then they try to go Philistinian on you, and then they try to go Israeli on you, and then they try to go Jewish on you, and then they try to go American on you. I mean, my gosh, you know, lately I've been hearing about these yahoos that are trying to get the yahushuas in, you know, and it's like, I want to say gesundheit. Every time somebody says yahushua, gesundheit. That's what I think. I mean, what'd you do, sneeze? Because it's not Hebrew, but they become spiritual prigs or spiritual jerks. Because they change the littlest thing, which doesn't seem important to you, maybe. But God treats it kind of important because it changes his name. And why would you want to change the name of God when he's already written it? He's already said it. He's already proven what it is. And suddenly now in the 21st century or 20th century, whatever century we're in, within the last 10 years, they're creating a new name for him. I just don't get it. I really don't. 
I mean, it's kind of goofy as it is with Jehovah, but that's at least closer to being accurate because the J, there's no J in Hebrew, but that's okay. So Jehovah gets pretty close. Jehovah would be better. That would be accurate. Um, but J for Jesus, you know, and then J for Jehovah makes sense because it's really the yud hey vav hey. It's a, it's a Y in Hebrew, so to speak, you know, because the letter really is basically a, a yud is a Y. And then the He is an H. And then the Vav is a V. You know, it's a Vav, you know. But then they go Vuv, you know, because it looks like some kind of whatever. So they try to make up these new words. And then they add an extra consonant in it. And you start going, well, where do you get this extra stuff? And why would you want extra? It sounds like a little detail or a shallow thing that I do whenever I mention it to someone. But... It's changing the word of God. And God said, if you changed the word at the end of the book of Revelation, or deleted it, or changed it, you would be, if you added to or taken away from the word of God, that you would be added to or taken away from the plagues that were all written therein. Meaning that you would be cast into tribulation period. People kind of forget about that one. Wait a minute. What did you just say? Well, let's just say, read the last part of the book of Revelation. At the very end, there's a blessing. Behold, I come quickly, you know, with great bride say come, you know, I'm coming. But there's also a curse. If anyone takes out or adds to, then all these things would be added to or taken from, you know, the book of life. You know. Really? Wouldn't want to be there. So, if we take care about the little things, as God is saying in this devotional, and the big things, God treats them all the same. It's only the big things we concentrate on, according to chambers, that... We do it because we want to appear spiritual. And I don't do it. I just do it because when it's Yahushua, I know it's wrong. It's not a Yahoo. It's a Yehu. It's Yeshua. Yehovah. It's yud Hey vav Hey. I didn't go and study my Hebrew in Israel just to go back to America and find out that they have a rap Hebrew now. You know, that's made up Hebrew that's not really Hebrew, but it's kind of like we're going to change it to Pentecostalize it so that we can kind of have our own little thing going. And that's what they did. To be shallow is not a sign of being wicked, nor is shallowness a sign that there is no deeps. The ocean has a shore. The shallow amenities of life, eating and drinking, walking and talking, are all ordained by God. These are the things in which our Lord lived. He lived in them as the Son of God, and he said that the disciple is not above his master. Our safeguard is in the shallow things. We have to live the surface common sense life in a common sense way. With the deeper things come. God gives them to us apart from the shallow concerns. Never show the deeps to anyone but God. We are so abominably serious and so desperately interested in our own characters that we refuse to behave like Christians in the shallow concerns of life. <clears throat> Determinedly take no, no one seriously but God. And the first person you find you have to leave severely alone as being the greatest fraud you have ever known is yourself. So you see, as I don't feel good, what God wants us to do is Take seriously cleaning the toilet. I'm serious. You'll find that there's a whole, whole teaching to be learned in cleaning the toilet. I had mentioned that one other time on the internet, and I asked, I said, well, who cleans your toilet? And the person said, well, I have other a pastor, you know, because I asked it in a setting that was for pastors, elders, deacons, you know, all these serious men of God, to answer. And the answer came back that, I work so I don't have to clean the toilet. And I wanted to write back, so your wife does? Because women know how much they put up with when it comes to men. Men think they know how much they put up with when it comes to women. But what God does in dealing with us is he doesn't put up with us, but he puts us to the test to see whether or not we would recognize that he sees all things always, everywhere, at all times. So, in dealing with spiritual matters, we are to take that same 
dedication or devotion that we have supposedly to the spiritual side of life and make it part of the reality of the physical side. Because in my day, as the Jesus movement was getting started or as it was growing and becoming very prevalent in the United States of America, as well as around the world, one of the things that a very famous teacher that I used to go to study on Monday night said, um, that he would never hire born-again Christians. He even made a tape about it, why he would not hire born-again Christians. Because they didn't know how to work. They were so spiritually minded, they were no earthly good. And that saying now is out there, but I try to change that to mean that we should be so spiritually minded, we're all earthly good. In other words, if God is so attentive to detail in heaven, then we should be just as attentive to detail here on earth. If he has so designed life that it has the RNA, the DNA, the nucleic acids, and it's so written in such a pattern, in such a beautiful way, that it's all custom designed in a such spectacular manner, that we likewise should arrange our lifestyle to be the same, that we should do it in such a spectacular manner, that we would be attentive to the detail, to the things that seem shallow, like cleaning toilets. So the man of God who responded to me that, you know, he didn't have to clean toilets, you know, he was above that, you know, I recognize that He's above seeing God in it. Excuse me, I'd almost like to say, do you see God in your toilet? Well, flush. I mean, it's not sacrilegious to say that God involves himself in our day-to-day -day life because the Son of Man did have bowel movements. The Son of Man did have to deal with that part of life. And no, he did not sit on a commode that was designed by, you know, the late 20th century, 19th century, or whatever we first came up with toilets. It was called stand and squat, you know, and dig a hole and bury it. So, while there may have been some other types, because Roman culture was there too, the reality is, is that God is and should be appreciated in all his infinite glory in the details of life that are practical, as well as in the spiritual life in a complete, holy, or they say nowadays in health and well, or health and medi medicine, holistic, which I would like to take the whole, the istic out and just say a holy, meaning W H O L L Y as well as H O L Y, life that completely encompasses God in all parts of our life. Thank you, God, for my bowel movement this morning. Thank you, God, for my gas. Thank you, God, for whatever it may be. Not to be repetitious about it, as the Jews do have a blessing for every single thing there is. There's a bracha to be made, you know, believe me, I could almost recite all of them, you know. If I didn't, I could look it up in the Talmudic writings, you know, we could find them, you know, we could give them to you so you could be spiritual and holy by applying the holiness into the practicality and seeing the practicality and the holiness. And then they get into where you, the Tanya and the... The Tanya is for the spiritual side and the... the Kabbalistic writings into the sexual side to try to make it into a spiritual side, to try to make it into a holy side, to try to encompass all of it, sometimes things get too carried away. But the reality is, God with you, God in you, God for you. Take God everywhere, and you'll find God is there already. And make Him just as much practical in your life as He is spiritual. Because Jesus lived this life that you're living. He felt some days like he didn't want to do it. Some days he woke up and just didn't want to go there. But because he got up before dawn and he spent that quality time with his father, he would always end his day of preparation or the morning time of preparation with not my will, but thy will be done, because by way of the Holy Spirit, he was able to accomplish all things and please his Father in everything. Imagine this, if you can, in practical reality. He pleased his Father in having a bowel movement. Now, how practical can you get about that? He pleased his Father in all things. God isn't meant to be sacrilegious, and that's not what I'm talking about. It isn't meant to be eating and drinking and worrying about whether it's a Thanksgiving that's kosher or a Thanksgiving that's eating ham or a Thanksgiving that's eating prime rib or a turkey or whether the turkey got its throat cut or whether it got hung by the neck. 
Who cares? The reality is, is that in the practical day-to-day -day living that you face yourself, take God there and you'll find that God wants to bless you in your practical day, in your emotional day, in your spiritual day, in all ways, every day.